happening uh, game based learning social emotional learning augmented reality and online corpora now let's take a look at uh, each of these uh, innovative uh, perspectives why well, it doesn't know okay so uh, as far as foreign language education context in the 21st century is concerned, the educational landscape is characterized by multiple shifts in pedagogical perspectives. Learning environments of the 21st century have started to embrace linguistically and culturally diverse learner profiles who are likely to be affected by various socio-political issues such as political instability, wars, as well as natural disasters, such as earthquakes. Now, our first innovative uh, pedagogical uh, perspective is culturally responsive teaching. Uh, the pre-service teacher education programs aim to equip uh, teacher candidates uh, with pedagogical and procedural knowledge to value diversity in learner population. A critical approach to teacher education is needed to promote equity and diversity in teaching contexts. In order to address uh, diverse learner profiles, today's teachers need to create a culturally responsive learning environment where students act as active participants, engage in construction of knowledge and the negotiation of meaning as active agents working against oppressive teaching and learning practices towards marginalizing uh, groups. In the 21st century, teacher education programs are expected to provide pre-service teachers with opportunities to prepare them to acknowledge and engage uh, multiple worldviews. Uh, culturally relevant teaching practices are based on three principles aiming at intellectual, social, emotional, and political empowerment of students. Students in the 21st century need to develop critical consciousness through which they challenge the status quo of the current uh, social order. Uh, three main, uh, the main principles of culturally responsive teaching could be listed as follows. Uh, CRT, uh, that's what we can call uh, culturally responsive teaching in short. It's a general curriculum that strives to increase the engagement and motivation of students of diverse backgrounds. Uh, it is designed to help empower children and youth by using meaningful cultural connections to convey academic and social knowledge and attitudes. Uh, culturally responsive teaching values and incorporates as appropriate a cu teacher's culture into instruction. CRT recognizes that the cultural identity of most teachers may be significantly different than their increasingly diverse student population. CRD provides support to cultural identities of struggling students while striving simultaneously to raise their academic achievement. CRD works to build an inclusive and welcoming classroom and school environment. Uh, it, they, it can create culturally appropriate approaches uh, to raising academic uh, expectations for all students. CRT is a student-centered strategy that incorporates into classroom teaching and school policies and practices, the cultural knowledge and assets of historically marginalized students and their communities and families. Um, it recognizes that teacher effectiveness decreases when instruction is primarily uh, uh, primarily geared uh, towards uh, teacher-centered uh, instruction. 
with an absence of student and community voices. CRT works to transform traditional educational norms of practice so that disparity is reduced between the cultural lives of students and their experiences with public schooling. And there are uh, certain uh, culturally responsive teaching strategies that I'd like to share with you. These are uh, as follows. Firstly, uh, learning about our students. So open communication can uncover our students' learning mm -hmm. styles. So surveys, questionnaires, and class discussions can be used for this purpose. The second one is interviewing students. Uh, then we can bring in guest yes, speakers and we can use learning stations and we can gamify our lessons. We can also use social media that depict a range of cultures. We can also experiment with peer teaching and establish cooperative based groups. We can also run problem-based learning scenarios. These are all could be used to enhance culturally responsive teaching environments. Uh, our second uh, innovative practice is the inclusive uh, education. Uh, so in using inclusive practices is one of the 12 professional practices in the British Council's CPD framework for teachers. Uh, it involves the following aspects, recognizing, accommodating, and meeting the learning needs of all students, acknowledging and valuing diversity among learners, avoiding stereotyping students as belonging to specific groups with predictable and fixed approaches to learning. Uh, using pedagogical strategies that encourage inclusive education within a supportive learning environment. Supporting uh, learners in identifying, addressing, and assessing a realistic individual learning goals based on responsible adjustment, being aware of beliefs and how uh, they can impact on establishing and maintaining an inclusive learning environment. Assessing individual learners in a variety of ways that allow them to demonstrate their progress and treating learners equitably and with respect. Uh, the last one uh, is developing positive attitudes towards diversity in learners, involving parents, learnings, and other relevant individuals in creating an inclusive environment and reflecting on how inclusive the learning environment is. And, uh, and our third uh, innovative practice perspective uh, is universal design for learning, inclusive curriculum design. Uh, increasingly diverse learner profiles of the 21st century underlined the importance of a more inclusive classroom design and integration of inclusive practices into the learning environments to promote learners' educational progress. Accessibility of instruction to a wide range of learners is postulated as the basis for a universal design for learning with multiple means for students' access to information, as well as their processing and internalizing of it, which poses a global challenge for the 21st century educators. UDL uh, is considered a pedagogical approach to respond to this, this challenge. It's a framework for designing flexible instructional environments and proactively integrating supports that address learner variability to provide equal opportunities for all learners. Okay, so uh, it has three main principles, uh, mean, uh, namely, 
uh, providing multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. Um, so uh, in order to enhance uh, multiple means of learner engagement, we can optimize individual choice and autonomy, uh, and we can minimize threats and distractions. In order to provide multiple means of representation, we can uh, tailor our uh, instruction uh, aligned uh, with the learning various learning styles of students. And in order to provide multiple means of action and expression, we can vary uh our uh we can vary the methods for response and, and navigation and we can optimize access to tools and assistive technologies okay uh now our fourth uh innovative perspective is the virtual exchange and telecollaboration the recent breakthroughs in educational technology are likely to render it possible for pre-service teachers to encounter cultural diversity through telecollaboration. Via their uh, ubiquitous nature, virtual exchange projects are likely to help learners to turn into empowered global citizens who could explore different ways of addressing various local <clears throat> and global issues in today's societies by means of international partnerships. Telecollaboration potentially provides an opportunity to enhance critical cultural awareness via negotiation of meaning. It's maintained that virtual exchange facilities facilitates language skills development, intercultural competence, and multiple literacies it also enables foreign language learners to be equipped with a variety of transversal skills to be responsive to the demands of the 21st century. Uh, however, it might pose uh, some challenges, uh, such as individual challenges at motivational and expectational levels, classroom challenges such as task design and social institutional challenges such as the organization of uh, students' course schedule and interactional challenges such as cultural differences in styles of uh, communication and behavior. And our fifth uh, innovative perspective is flipped learning. Emergency remote teaching, which started with the advent of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, has brought a vast array of unprecedented changes in English as a foreign language teaching and teacher education. The sudden shift to online teaching on a global scale has posed unsurmountable pedagogical and technological challenges to education at all levels of education and in different teaching contexts. The educators felt a compelling need to consider how to adjust their face-to-face -face instructional challenges to effectively address the emergent learning needs of their students engaged in online teaching and how to align online pedagogies with contextual constraints uh, in this turbulent uh, global educational landscape. Flip learning is an innovative pedagogical approach where a traditional instruction is reversed with the presentation of new concepts to a class session, adding uh, more class time to collaborative, active, differentiated, and individualized learning through critical thinking and problem solving tasks. Flip learning can support the creation of an inclusive teacher learner centered classroom and curriculum. It tends to incorporate a technologically rich environment with group network learners, individualized and group instruction, autonomous, self-reflective and flexible learning. So in flip learning, there are three phases, before class, during class and after class. In before class phase, students uh, get accustomed to the new concepts and class material through digital challenges. And during class phase, 
students explore these new concepts through learning activities such as discussions, problem solving, and critical thinking. And in the after class phase, students continue mastery and understanding of material through higher order thinking skills. So, and at all, uh, Bloom's revised taxonomy is adopted in uh, organizing teaching learning activities. And in flipped uh, learning, the teacher educator assumes the facilitator role uh, involved uh, with the guidance and scaffolding. Students are involved in the application of concepts and in the creative engagement of the subject matter. So our sixth innovative perspective is the game-based learning. Game-based learning today involves the use of computer and video games specifically aiming to produce learning outcomes. It's designed to balance subject matter and gameplay and later assesses the uh, ability of learner uh, to retain and apply the acquired knowledge to real world scenarios. Digital game-based learning is appealing to students if they have the following elements. Competition that provides motivation for students to start and finish the game. Uh, engagement that makes students want to play and have fun and immediate rewards and feedback. And our next uh, innovative perspective is the social emotional learning. Social emotional learning uh, is both a teaching approach and a process that focuses on the development and strengthening of the effective skills necessary for individuals to be a healthy, happy, and successful and responsible individual. Although different interpretations exist, social-emotional learning is defined as the processes by which children and adults acquire and apply competences uh, to recognize and manage emotions set and achieve positive goals, appreciate the perspectives of others, establish and maintain support, make responsible decisions and handle personal and interpersonal situations constructively. The goal of social emotional learning is to promote positive, supportive, engaging and participatory learning environments. Uh, social emotional learning practices typically cover strategies grounded in restorative practices, bibliotherapy, and mindfulness. Restorative practices are broadly defined as strategies focused on mitigating negative emotions and behaviors and promoting social emotional restoration and positive behaviors. Bibliotherapy is understood as the use of reading and writing materials to promote positive emotions and mitigate negative emotions. Lastly, mindfulness refers to different activities focused on helping students embrace the present moment, increasing self-awareness and reducing negative emotions. The end goal of these social emotional learning practices is to increase students' well-being in the classroom and beyond by providing them with strategies uh, on how to regulate negative emotions and behaviors. Um, traditionally, the field of ELT has been primarily focused on teaching uh, language and content, living concerns of social social emotional needs and well-being on the periphery. However, in our uh, present reality, uh, ELT classrooms need to become a space that transcends traditional English instruction for academic purposes and relies on language as a tool for restoration, support, and flourishing our students. Having the opportunity to engage in meaningful, caring, respectful fellowship and interactions in the classroom is essential for our students' well-being. And our, uh, okay, so 
I would like to skip uh, to our next innovative practice. Uh, uh, our next innovative practice is the augmented reality. So recently, one of the immersive technologies, augmented reality, has started to take place in different walks of life with the proliferation of mobile technologies. Augmented reality was defined by Wang as a combination of technologies that superimpose computer-generated content over a real-world environment. Being regarded as a promising emergent technology in educational settings, likely to raise the engagement of uh, students in the learning process, it allows overlaying digital information uh, on, in a real world through the attachment of photos, text, 3D models, and various websites and videos. Uh, AR is quite in line with certain learning theories, such as constructive, constructivist learning, situated learning, game-based learning, and inquiry-based learning. Um, the educational applications, such as the mobile ones, uh, as uh, Orasma, Wikitude, uh, Layer, uh, and Augment, uh, AR technologies are increasingly gaining popularity and incorporated into English classrooms. However, to date, there is still a paucity of research into AR-enhanced system and applications for language learning. A majority of AR-enhanced systems and mobile applications have been developed for teaching science and mathematics. Um, Uh, as for the use of AR technology for productive language teaching, uh, quite a few studies uh, can be identified in the literature. Uh, in almost all cases, except for uh, the study of Tobar and Munoz, uh, that AR technology made significant contributions to the reading skills of uh, learners. As for the uh, listening skill, uh, it is reported that learners significantly improved their listening skills. Um, however, uh, they were not uh, there were not enough attempts to generalize the AR technology uh, is effective for improving speaking skills. The research on the implementation of AR technology for writing skills, revealed a significant effect of this technology on the writing skills of learners. Uh, however, vocabulary uh, learning was the most studied language subskill in terms of the integration of AR into the ELT field. Almost all these studies show the positive impact of AR technology uh, on a variety of uh, language skills. And uh, our last perspective is the uh, is online corpora. Corpus linguistics is an innovative way of language analysis through research materials called corpora. The scope of corpus linguistics is not only limited to language research. First mentioned in Johns, the data-driven learning (DDL) refers to the pedagogical application of corpus linguistics. In DDL, students analyze the language using corpus tools and follow similar procedures of linguistic analysis. Uh, and optionally, the teacher acts as a coordinator of the student-led research. The effectiveness of DDL is also reflected in recent literature. In a meta-analysis, Cobb and Bolton analyzed eight studies employing post-tests as a treatment to measure the effectiveness of using corpora in teaching. The findings indicated that the use of corpora in language teaching is highly effective. Uh, a potential area of research promoting a further investigation is the use of DDL with young learners. Uh, using corpus tools, a range of awareness raising and consciousness raising activities can be designed to help learners to notice 
the target forms and infer grammar rules on their own. The keyword in context function in of corpus tools, for instance, presents learners with textual enhancements by highlighting the target structure in a sentence in, uh, in, a sen in sentence making uh, the input more salient. The limited spread of DDL can be attributed to the lack of clarity regarding the theoretical background, limitations of limitations in the pedagogical application, pra practitioners' prejudices uh, against it, and a lack of research investigating the issue from different angles. Most teachers consider themselves to lack the knowledge to use corpora and find corpus use time consuming. Therefore, they don't adopt a DDL in their classrooms. Um, adopting data analysis tools like uh, concordancers uh, to pedagogical settings is of great importance because they might bring innovations and creativity to language uh, teaching, especially for writing development. The advent of corpora has affected writing skill development more than any other skill area. Um, so uh, I would like to skip this one. And uh, I'd like to right now mention uh, several corpus tools very briefly. Uh, the first one is the sketch engine. So the sketch engine is a multifunctional tool which is used by lexicographers, language researchers, and teachers. Users can have a 30-day uh, trial access to website. Uh, it draws its resources from various corpora sources, and it's a versatile tool offering functions such as concordancing, thesaurus, and a word sketch for language analysis. So you can see a screenshot of the... Uh, sketch engine. And uh, collocations are a significant barrier for L2 learners. And several programs have been developed uh, for students to choose the appropriate collocation. Collocate, for example, uh, is an editor for assisting students with the conventions of academic writing in, in an interactive DDL approach. Uh, so it provides options on the correct uses of collocations through multiple concordances. And another free of charge corpus website, Just the Word, is a popular corpus driven tool that demonstrates combinations of the queried word with other words as well as concordance lines, highlighting the word combination patterns under observation. It is uh, a simple and user-friendly interface, doesn't require potential users to have in-depth knowledge of corpora. When users type uh, one or multiple words in, a, in the search box and click on the alternatives button, it can give information about the co-occurrence uh, strength of these items. The strength of combinations is decided based on the frequency of occurrence. You can see a screenshot of uh, the Corpus website here. Um, rather than using a web page, if an instructor wants to employ the standalone software and use it in language teaching, AntConc could be used uh, as a good option. Uh, AntConc software is open source and it is widely used by both researchers and language instructors around the world. With AntConc, uh, one can investigate lexical and collocational frequency, create and compare word lists, explore word clusters and engrams either in an L1 corpus or a learner corpus. Uh, those features have the potential to guide language instructors while designing materials and help them design in-class activities through which they can present new grammar structures in naturally occurring context, context and introduce academic registers to 
novice writers. Thank you for listening. And uh, here are my references. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we said that we will just uh, postpone uh, the question and answer session uh, till the end. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce our second uh, speaker, uh, Muhammad Musab Vazan. Uh, he will be talking about uh, classroom dialogue with the microblogging tools. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Vazan. Merhaba, hocam. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this invitation. I'd like to sincerely thank my dear colleague, Dr. Noor Hoca from the Social Sciences University of Ankara for having invited me to take part in this wonderful event. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I am a third year PhD student at Anadolu University, and I also work at the Social Sciences University of Ankara too. Um, uh, let me share my slides because I think I have limited time, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, just a jiffy, please. Yeah, I think um, you can see my screen right now, right? Yes. Okay, welcome again, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to set off an interesting journey. Well, a journey that I think is interesting. And we'd like I'd like to share with you uh, some interesting information about dialogue and and a microblogging tool called Talkwall. Um, so let me just share the aims for this workshop. Um, it's not a presentation actually. Um, so I'd like to um, start off with a practical introduction into a dialogic teaching with Talkwall. Um, then I'd like to take you with me to explore ground rules for talk and how we can apply them to our classrooms. And finally, I'd like to share with you a wonderful and effective coding framework, in my opinion, that we can what utilize uh, for analyzing our dialogic teaching and learning. Um, uh, because I am an empirical <laughs> what novice researcher, so let me, let me just um, delve into practice. I'd like to kindly ask you, ask you to use your digital devices, log into Talkwall, please, and uh, and use the pin code that you can see uh, on screen, 9291. And hopefully that would take you to this page. Let me just share the screen with you again. Yeah, I think um, here we go. Yeah. All right, most of you have successfully joined in. So I just kind of ask you to share with me what you think about dialogic teaching. What words or phrases come to your mind when you hear Dialogic teaching. In order to share with me your uh, what your um, definitions or your words, you need to hover um, your mouse here and click here so that you can add your contribution. So, for example, I would just say um, engagement, maybe engagement, and then I would um, share it with me here. So here we go. So maybe one minute, if you can share with me what you think about DT or dialogic teaching. Um, this is the code again, if you um, just forget it. Hmm. Um, I'm going to share it in the channel. So yeah.
Um, I hope things are working well. No glitches. <clears throat> ah, you wrote something. Okay. You shared something. So let me just refresh maybe the page. That would um a big because I haven't refreshed it. Now you can see it because I have to refresh the page so that we can see new contributions. Okay, so we've got Zina Poja and Nihanoja as well here. Interactive learning, better engagement. Okay, great. Maybe 30 more seconds. Let me just refresh it again. And maybe last 10 seconds. So we can I've got here one more two. Okay, so we've got two contributions by the same <coughs> participant. Hmm. Okay, so just all right, five seconds and that's it. Now, thank you very much for having what well, taken part in this. Uh, now, um, um, now, what happens after we? Okay, thank you, Hojam, for sharing this community practice as well. Let me refresh it one more. All right. Now, what happens after we ask students to share their insights into our task or our question? We can simply um, what display this. We can just pin it to the wall so that all the students can see all your contribution here, or we can drag it to your wall like this one here, so that we can share all our contributions uh, what's with the whole class. And then we can just invite students to look at them for a moment, and perhaps we can uh, what highlight the most interesting or the most captivating what answer. Um, uh, now, after this moment, and this is the important thing about this uh, with this dialogic what um, teaching tool. Now, of course, you can unpin them so that they can go back to their places. Here we go. Now, what we would do in our classroom, I have got limited time, so I, I don't think I can ask you to go to breakout rooms to discuss together which one or which uh, word or phrase do you think uh, you agree with the most. So um, I would kindly, for example, ask my students, of course, I would have to activate this button here, uh, let participants share walls. So uh, during their group work, they can come together and talk about what they think is the most practical definition or is the most interesting idea that they agree with and perhaps that they disagree with. Now, in order to do that, we'll have to click here. This is the contribution. This is the individual contribution what panel. We'll go to the uh, what participants' walls. Now, um, uh, if you can do it very quickly, can you just drag one of these to your wall or pin one of them to your wall, please? In one minute. So for example, let's um, go to my wall, I think. And uh, what, um, for me, I don't think I can do it, but you can. So interactive learning, if I go to my wall here, um, you can see that I have chosen Zaina Poch's definition or word, interactive learning. Now, you can do that, of course. Uh, so if I want to focus on group one, for example, I would go for what Nihanoja's wall, and she chose community practice, all right? And of course, the group one would do the same thing, two and three and four. Now, this is something important. Now, what comes before sharing is the most important thing here. And this is about what, uh, what Neil Mercer from the University of Cambridge talked about. And this is about ground rules for talk. Uh, I think it's unclear. So let me just share my PowerPoint presentation with you again and come back to this in a, in a jiffy. Um, so let me just, I think you can share, you can see my screen now, right? Yeah, okay. So, okay. So um, if I go just to, to, uh, to, what, to the ground rules here and then I come back to this one, uh, um, 
we have got what uh, a famous professor called Neil Mercer from the University of Cambridge, and he came up with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, ground rules for talk. And these rules are just teacher rules uh, that he or she shares with their students, or they can together come up with classroom rules that are effective for their group work when they work together. For me, I've come up with this, uh, with these ground rules for talk, and I usually uh, would display them, uh, what, over, over the projector so that students while working in groups can focus on one of these ground rules. So for example, I think yesterday we had a group discussion about uh, this about a description of uh, of a favorite natural place in in Turkey and we focused on the uh, with what uh, the green one everyone's ideas should be listened to. Because usually when we have a group of students working together, usually two or three people talk and the other one or the other two, uh, what are silent. So three or four, we call them what the, are the lion's share. So that's why ground rules for talk can really help them to, to talk uh, what to each other, to discuss their ideas together. Uh, because uh, what, before they share their, what um, their, their responses. Now, if I just go back to talk wall here, um, what uh, how it works? Well, it, it is a free tool first of all, and uh, I just found it to be interesting. Um, I hope there are what relevant tools that are similar to this one. So we can just go to the website here. Uh, you have to log in with your Google what uh, accounts or Facebook accounts. For me, I just use my Google authentication one here. Uh, let me just um, sign again, hopefully. This part. All right, now here we go. In order to create a wall, you would have just to what uh, click here and add a title. So for example, we can call what nature, uh, subject English, group level, uh, EAP or what gen, uh, A2 for A2 might be difficult. So let's go for B1 here yeah, as well. And here we go. You can create your wall. Uh, now, interestingly here, um, you can add a task like this one. Uh, for example, uh, what, uh, what makes a great teacher? Right, and then you can allow maybe images, external content and contributions, so students can share images with you here. You can choose uh, what the background type that you favor, the color. And here's something interesting: if you want to limit the number of words, uh, perhaps you can uh, for for the purpose of challenging your students to what to limit their responses for for a for any particular reason or purpose, you can do that by going from 140 characters to 500 characters. Now, if we say 500 characters, let's save it now. And you can do it like this. And here's the pin code that students can use to uh, to enter to your wall. And this is now, if you wanna allow the sharing of each other's walls, you, uh, you should go to the participants walls, advanced and make this active. Let participants share walls. They can even share your wall if you want to be a participant with, with them too. Uh, interestingly, you can filter their responses if you've got a large number of students, 30, 40, uh, which is uh, what's not common. You can filter the responses according to a hashtag. So if, if, if you're having a discussion about what makes a great teacher, they might have a response and then they can use the hashtag, for example, what uh, a motivator or facilitator. Um, so this is in brief something about TalkWall. Um, you can even, I think, uh, what go to the gallery part here and you can choose some what ready-made templates for you. Uh, of course, this, uh, this has been designed by the University of Norway, I think with the collaboration with collaboration with the University of Cambridge and it supports English and Norwegian, I think. Uh, now, the rationale behind such a tool, you can come up with different tools if you want. Uh, the idea is just to uh, what uh, make students uh, um, discuss their ideas together, uh, because usually some of these indicators are not common in some of our classes. 
uh, especially when we ask students to listen to each other's ideas and agree and disagree before voicing their opinion. And now we have got uh, what uh, what uh, an education dialogue guru called Robin Alexander. And according to him, the whole purpose of dialogic teaching is to stimulate and extend students' thinking uh, so that uh, this can enable them to discuss, reason, and argue. Now, uh, I think you agree with me that this is really difficult to implement it with uh, our uh, pre-intermediate learners of English or elementary learners of English. But again, we can do it like when we ask simple questions. What's your favorite city? We can push the students to... Uh, what to give a reason for the choice, and that in a way uh, can stimulate our in our teaching and learning environment. According to him, he has come up with uh, five, I think, six main principles of the logic teaching. The first one is about collective, taking the learning journey together. The second one is about purposeful, being purposeful, having specific learning goals. The third one, cumulative, which is I think the most important one, we need to build on each uh, other's contributions. So it's not the teacher who always talks. Uh, it is also the students who, who talk and they invite their peers to contribute to their discussion. W with that learning environment, the logic, uh, what teaching and learning can take place. Of course, it's about being supportive and finally reciprocal. And this needs to be accompanied with ground rules for talk that I have already talked about here. Now, uh, after we do this, we need to um, just in two minutes, uh, what analyze our own dialogic teaching and learning. And that I think the University of Cambridge has come up with a coding framework that can help us analyze our classroom discourse. And they call it the uh, what the teacher scheme for educational dialogic analysis or dialogue analysis, TCDA. All right. Now, uh, in my last classroom research, I focused on the first five because I thought that these were really important for my classroom. So, for example, if we want to focus on building on ideas, we can uh, what these are the usual phrases or keywords that you can that you can hear. Uh, now to put this into action, um, um, here's what I did in my last uh, humble piece of research. Um, uh, so uh, so um, this was taken uh, from my whole class discussion about jobs and films with my students, and I think that's me. <laughs> All right, so after my students had worked in groups uh, to share with each other what jobs they've always wanted to do, um, I asked them to listen to each other and then share their responses on talk wall, where they had the chance to share one job that they found to be really important and or interesting uh, to do from the other group walls. Uh, so apparently, so basically, they needed to share uh, what uh, some of the group's ideas that they thought were interesting and appealing to them. Uh, during that time, they had to come. They had to come up with good reasons uh, for sharing that particular job, and this was followed by a kind of teacher-student dialogue, as well as group-to-group -group dialogues. And uh, as you can see here, B and I R stand for uh, building on each other's ideas. It was me who, uh, who who tried to build on their ideas. And then I used what uh, inviting reasoning. I invited other students to build on this idea. And uh, yeah, and of course, I utilized waiting time. I tried to wait for about 10 seconds so that I could allow what more thinking time on their part. Uh, final thoughts on this one. So this is briefly how TalkWall works and the rationale behind it. Uh, I think this could be could be a promising approach to foreign language education. And uh, also, we can integrate microblogging tools such as TalkWall or other. Uh, I am not advocating for talk wall i just uh, what uh, learned about it while reading uh, what some research articles and i was really interested in it and i thought it might work and it really does uh, but i hope we can come up with different what applications that we can utilize with our students so we can uh, integrate such tools into our language education curricula I think um, this is everything uh, on my part, and these are the references, and hopefully uh, my piece of research will be published soon, although it's been taking a while. 
Um, you can find more information about TSEDA from the Faculty of Education website, the, the University of Cambridge. And if you're interested in doing remote research, we can collaborate together. This is my email. And thank you very much for your time. And I hope it's been a useful presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wazan, for uh, this informative talk. Yeah. Thank you, Ajam. Well, I am still not a doctor. I'm just... Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can, thank okay. you. Thank you you so can call much. me Mohammed, Ajam. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Mohammed. Right. Yes, now our, uh, we'll be moving on uh, to our second uh, speaker, Dr. Kad uh, Kadriya Aytaç Demirci. Uh, she will be uh, giving us a talk on uh, online gender hate discourse towards women managers in Turkey. Uh, yeah, Dr. Aytaş Demirci, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hocam. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kadri Aytaç Demirçivi. Uh, I'm, I'm working at Aksaray University uh, School of Foreign Languages. Uh, now I'd like to share my study uh, with the title Online Gendered Hate Discourse Towards Women Managers in Turkey. Uh, you know, uh, in our digital age, social media provides uh, the users with the possibility to share content and express their opinions about anything at any time. Uh, yet this ease of uh, expression has also a dark side resulting in the uh, proliferation of abusive language. And one example of such abusive language is misogynistic speech, which is simply the hatred of women. And online misogyny might be detected in a variety of situations. And one of these situations is the case of women working in traditionally male-dominated occupations as the percentages of women getting employed in those gender atypical occupations have increased worldwide recently. And as highlighted by Miguel and Feitosa, women are largely seen as obtruders in a space designed under a male's perspective. And uh, when it comes to uh, participatory online spheres, they provide new and exciting opportunities for research on different collective representations. And we can evaluate online media as a collection of discursive spaces in which ideologies concerning gender roles are constructed. And as they have a crucial role in the construction of gender discourses, these spheres might also be exclusionary and discriminatory. Uh, and they also have the potential to encourage online hostility. And there are several studies uh, concerned with the gender in social media platforms in Turkey. To name a few, for example, Metin Achar uh, analyzes the hegemonic discourses on the idealized body perception by analyzing the entries under the titles Turkish male body and Turkish female body in Ekşi Sözlük. And the results reveal that Turkish female body uh, was belittled and underestimated as it was uh, associated with traditionalism. And similarly, focusing on appearance and female body expectations, uh, Bilgin Ülken and Yüce analyzed the entries under the title of the guy who is in a relationship with a fat girl in Ekşi Sözlük. And the results reveal that the comments under this title are intensely negative, marginalizing women uh, with uh, intensely negative verbs uh, and uh, insults. Uh, and in a similar way, uh, Küçükşen uh, also investigates the comments associated with social gender equality and social gender inequality in Ekşi Sözlük and Uda Sözlük. And the results indicate that they predominantly reduce women to their um, appearance by means of uh, overwhelmingly appearance-based judgments. And as for this study, uh, it analyzes the entries under the title of Women Managers in Ekşi Sözlük, and it tries to seek answers for these three research questions. The first one is related to the depiction of women managers and the features that are attributed to them in Ekşi Sözlük. And the second uh, question uh, investigates the discursive arguments that are employed in justifying any online prejudice or welcoming attitudes towards women managers. 
And lastly, uh, the last research question is concerned with the intensification and mitigation strategies that are used to reinforce or soften those arguments. And regarding the analytical framework, uh, the aims of this study align with the framework of discourse historical approach and critical discourse analysis. Uh, women managers are portrayed as uh, social actors uh, as they represent a significant social problem related to power and uh, social discrimination due to their gender. Uh, in this study, uh, the theory of discourse and ideology was also referred to as it considers discourse analysis as ideological analysis and the ideological work as uh, created by discourse. Um, so in order to collect the relevant data for this study, uh, a corpus was built from the entries under the title of Women Managers in Ekshi Sözlük. And there were 300 entries, which totally included 16,883 words. And the uh, entries were written between the years 2005 and 2021. Uh, in the analysis phase, uh, five discursive strategies, which are referential, nomination, predication, perspectivation, argumentation, intensification, and mitigation strategies were investigated in the data. Uh, first of all, according to WODA, one basic question related to referential and nomination strategies is how people are named and referred to linguistically. First of all, uh, the very presence of the gender title women managers in Ekshi Sözlük uh, has a preliminary role in constructing an exclusionary discourse. The corresponding title man managers does not even exist in the dictionary. Uh, most probably, it is uh, uh, being male is perceived as the default or unmarked gender of managers. And one of the other strategies, considering referential and nomination strategies, is the use of dictative markers, this and these, to imply in group and out group distinction. For example, in extracts one and two, uh, the use of the dictative pronouns, this and these, uh, imply a belittlement and uh, deprecation towards women managers combined with intensely negative words and phrases such as hung up, mean, and barking like a dog. And in the second extract, the writer also uses the word type to refer to women managers, which can be regarded as another ne negative representation, as in Turkish, the word tip is mostly used when talking about undesirable people. Uh, and use of sarcasm stands out as another a strategy for referential nomination strategies. In this extract, uh, the author uses the expression this manager typecasting to refer to women managers. This expression also questions the validity of the term manager for women. And the word typecasting, which is a very common noun in television, movies, and theater, uh, actually ironically implies that the term manager does not actually apply to women, and they just act as if they are managers. And there is also a very strong inclination to classify women in an array of categories in the data. Uh, and this classification has also a very scorning and belittling tone, as it is centered on women's marital status, their age, and whether they have children or not. Um, regarding the predication strategies, the main concern are uh, qualities, characteristics that are attributed to people. And in the data set, negative uh, qualities that were inscribed to human managers overwhelmingly outnumber the positive ones. And these qualities were attributed by means of intensely negative adjectives severe words and insults, which in turn contribute to the expression of hate. Uh, there were also some positive attributions, although they were outweighed by the negative ones. Uh, some of these attributions include adjectives such as marvelous and unique. 
and uh, the adjectives practical, nimble, and solution finder are related to the occupational abilities of human managers. Uh, and there are also some adjectives that are related to the physical uh, traits and appearance of human managers, such as beautiful and elegant. However, these adjectives also reinforce uh, traditional feminine stereotypes as they uh, serve as tools for doing gender. And regarding the argumentation strategies, topoi are used to justify any inclusion or exclusion. In this extract, employing the topos of disadvantages, uh, this extract is a counter argument for the presence of women managers as it focuses on the undesirable qualities of women, such as being overly polite, not being able to see the big picture, not having the qualities of a good leader. Um, and the argumentation regarding politeness inflates even more with the word obsession. And here also, utilizing the uh, topos of disadvantages and topos of uh, danger and threat, this uh, extract also presents marginalizing arguments regarding women managers, as it also focuses on some undesirable qualities, such as being hot-tempered, uh, exaggerating trivial issues. And the entry also uh, claims that these features might result in being unbearable in the workplace. And uh, in terms of the perspectivation strategies, uh, the main concern, concerns are the opinions and perspectives from which attributes, arguments are verbalized. And when employing perspectivation strategies, authors usually uh, provide some anecdotes from their own life. And in this extract, uh, this is a negative, a negative position for women managers based on the writer's own experiences uh, using uh, several intensifying expressions formed by exclamations such as, oh my God, God forbid it again. And a superlative uh, like um, the most terrible eight months of uh, my life make the situation even more negative. And the argument gets even more empathic with the integration of a semiotic feature, the emoticon, uh, immediately after the command about what happened when the author got rid of uh, his or her human manager. Uh, and in terms of the intensification strategies, the analysis shows that those strategies are mainly employed by means of idioms, uh, wishes and praise, superlatives and exclamations. In this extract, uh, the expressions, uh, the most difficult manager, um, derive me from pillar to post, and facial paralysis even make the situation more dramatic. Uh, the author also uses the expression, uh, her interesting character, to refer to women managers. He or she also indicates that uh, he's trying to be polite, in the parentheses, which is another sarcastic and criticizing tone for uh, women managers. And the mitigation strategies, uh, usually disclaimers such as all generalizations are wrong, but, or I'm not generalizing, but, are commonly used in the data. These two extracts provide some examples for these expressions that are used to mitigate the illocutionary force of the previously mentioned utterances. And another strategy for mitigation is accentuating the differences, the individual differences, and focusing on the idea that gender does not matter regarding effective managing. Uh, so in these excerpts, uh, the expressions, women managers are not always bad. It doesn't matter what their gender is human specific situations and uh, by nature moderate the strength of the previously mentioned utterances. So in conclusion, the findings of this study uh, indicate a clear exclusionary and hateful discourse that marginalizes women managers as the negative other in the data by means of the discursive strategies that were employed and the analysis shows that women are still looked in traditional and cultural expectations that assert their inadequacy in uh, managing professions. 
and also the frequency of a condescending and duplicative tone with a with a myriad of insults and bad language inflate uh, the online misogyny even more. And it's also significant to note the limitations of this study. In this study, only the entries uh, under the title of women managers were investigated. However, in Ekshi there are also other titles such as um, working with women managers, challenges of working with women managers. So an analysis of those uh, titles might also provide deeper insights to the discursive construction of women managers uh, in Ekshi and this study was published as an article uh, in Women's Studies International Forum. These are the references. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Kadriya Aytaç Demirci, for this uh, insightful and uh, innovative talk. Thank you so much. You. Now, uh, yes, I will be uh, moving on to our last uh, speaker, uh, speakers actually. So, Assistant Professor Dr. Zeynep Bashar and Assistant Professor Dr. Uh, Mehta Paral. They will be giving us a talk uh, on being translator in an artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence source. The floor is yours. Thank you. Teşekkür ederiz. Herkese merhabalar. Ee, biz sunumu Türkçe olarak planlamıştık. Ee, ben ilk baş kısmını sadece sunacağım. Ee, devamını Zeynep Hocam e, anlatacak. Hocam slaytı geçebilirsin. Ee, i̇lk başta e, amacımızı e, açıklayacağız. Ardından e, yapay zeka ve çeviriyle ilgili genel bir literatür bilgisi. E, veri toplamaya ilişkin bilgiler, katılımcılara ilgili ilişkin bilgiler, e, araştırmamızın bulgunları, tartışma ve sonuç kısmı olacak. E, bu çalışmada bizim amacımız İngilizce müterdim tercümanlık ana dilim dalındaki öğrencilerin e, çeviri yaparken, yaparken yapay zeka uygulamaları ya da yapay zeka entegre edilmiş çeviri araçlarının kullanımını, e, çeviri menlifesinin geleceği ve bölüm müfredatına ilişkin görüşlerini tespit etmesi. E, i̇kinci amacımız ise birinci sınıf öğrencileri ve dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerinin bu konudaki görüşlerini kıyaslamaktı. E, genel olarak kısaca bir yapay zeka ve çeviri ilişkin e, terimlerden e, bahsedecek olursak, yapay zeka e, insan zekasının yapay araçlarla takdir, ed takdir edilmesi, e, günümüzde hepimizin aslında kullandığı e, şeyleri görüyoruz. Chat GPT gibi ya da e, Google Translate deyip her gibi programlara entegre edilmiş halde olduğunu e, biliyoruz. E, peki bu e, yapay zekanın altında başka hangi terimler var diye bakacak olursak e, birincisi makine öğrenmesi. E, makine öğrenmesi yapay sinir ağları ile ilgili e, ile algoritmalar ile öğrenme. E, derin öğrenme ise yapay sinir ağları ile algoritmalar ile eski verilerden derin sinir ağları ile öğrenme. Aslında e, yapay zeka e, bütün e, webdeki ya da kendi veri tabanındaki e, bilgilerden e, yeni e, çıkarımlar yaparak e, öğrenerek e, bize e, amacımıza, ihtiyaçlarımıza göre e, bilgiyi sunması, e, bizim bağlamamıza çeviriyi sunması. E, doğal dil işlemeye bakacak olursak eğer bu da aslında bilgisayar yardımıyla dillerin, seslerin işlemlenmesi, alımlanması ve yine makine yardımıyla öğrenilmesi aslında. E, yapay zeka ile ilgili e, bu e, şekil aslında bize yapay zekanın derin öğrenme ve makine öğrenmesini kapsadığını e, gösteriyor. E, Yapay zeka ve çeviri kısmında çeviri boyutuna bakacak olursak e, ilk kavramımız makine çevirisi. Hocam geçebiliriz hocam. E, makine çevirisinde aslında hepimiz az çok e, kullanıyoruz. Yani biz çevirme araç zaten sürekli kullanıyoruz. E, Microsoft Translator, 
e, Google Translate, Bing Translate, e, Yandex Translate ya da e, Google ve bunun gibi daha bir sürü e, program var. Bir program aracılığıyla bir metni başka dile e, otomatik olarak çeviri yapma eylemi aslında metne çevirisi. E, ancak hepinizin bildiği bir şey var. Bu Google Translate'in neural makine öğrenmesi, makine çevirisiyle birlikte aklında bir şeyler e, değişiyor makine çevirisinde. E, bu da aslında makinenin öğrenme tekniklerini alarak yani öğrenerek bize e, çeviri yapmayı e, yapmaya başlaması. E, bilgisayar destekli çeviri ise e, bunlardan birazcık daha farklı. Aslında bir insanın çeviri yaparken bilgisayar araçlarından destek alması. Bu bağlamda da en yaygın olan e, şu anda çevirmenlik piyasasında Trados, Memsource, Smartcat, Memocule gibi programlar var. Programların bazıları e, masaüstü, bazıları ise e, bulut tabanlı uygulamalar. E, bunlar da doğrudan amaç makine çevirisi gibi otomatik bir şekilde çeviriyi almak değil. E, çeviri bellekleri, e, terim bankaları aracılığıyla e, ve daha önceki yaptığımız çevirileri kullanarak e, bizim e, kendi veri tabanımızı oluşturmamız ve oradan gelen eşleştirmeleri kullanarak çeviri yapmamız. Ee, ancak yakın e, gelecekte, geçmişte olan bir şey de makine çevirisinin bilgisayar destekli çeviri araçlarına da entegre edilmesi. E, bundan birkaç yıl öncesinde e, bu araçların hepsinde makine çevirisi entegresi yoktu. Şu an hem çeviri belleklerinden öneriler sunabiliyor bize hem de makine çevirisinden örnekler sunabiliyor. Bu şekilde aslında çevirmen bu araçları kullanarak hem şekilsel olarak değişiklik e, yapmaya çok da gerek duymadan e, hem de makine çevirisinin üzerinden pas düzeltme yaparak ya da daha önceki kendi çevirilerin üzerinden pas düzeltme yaparak daha kısa sürede daha etkili ve tutarlı çeviriler elde edebiliyor. Sonraki slide'da da. E, bu konuda Hatchin ve Somer'in e, çok bilinen, meşhur bir e, diyagramı var. Bu diyagrama göre zaten makine çevirisinin ilk başlangıçta 1940'lar 50'lerde ortaya atıldığı dönemde hedeflenen tam otomatik yüksek kalite bilgisayar çevirisi. Bu ne demek? Aslında makinenin bize sunduğu çeviriyi olduğu gibi kullanılabilir halde almak ve kullanmak. Herhangi bir insan müdahalesi olmadan olması. Diğer uçlarda tamamen insan eliyle yapılmış bir çeviri var. Yani bu aradaki DDC ise bilgisayar destekli çeviri araçlarındaysa biraz önce bahsettiğim gibi çeşitli araçlar kullanarak e, terim bankaları, e, bilgisayar destekli çeviri araçları e, bunun gibi pek çok farklı aracı kullanarak onlardan yardım alarak e, çeviri yapılması süreci aslında. Geçebilir miyiz bakalım? E, kısaca makine çevirisinin şu anki e, bir, e, yapay zeka entegre halinin nasıl geldiğine bakacak olursak ilk başta olan e, kural temelli makine çevirisi. Kural temelli makine çevirisinde aslında sözlükler ve dil bilgisi kuralları baz alınarak yapılıyor. 1950'lerden 80'lere kadar kullanılan e, temel makine çevirisi bu ve arkasındaki yaklaşım bu. 80-90 arasında ise örnek, e, ta, örneklem tabanlı makine çevirisi var. E, bu kısımda ise e, paralel metinlerden verileri çekerek bize makinenin öneriler sunması söz konusu. E, bir sonraki dönemde 99-2015 yapılan kadar olan süreçte ise fiziksel makine çevirisi var. E, aslında burada makine öğrenmesinin daha çok başladığı bağlama göre kelimelerin önerilerinin sunulduğu, birden fazla bağlamda farklı anlamı gelecek kelimelerin çıkarıldığı, söz diziminin daha düzenlendiği bir dönem var. Ve 2015'ten sonra Google Translate'in tamamen makine öğrenmesiyle bize sunduğu Neural makine çevirisi var ve şu anki günümüzde ise yapay zekanın da buna entegre edilmiş haliyle aslında derin öğrenmenin de gerçekleşmesiyle bir tık daha ilerisine geçmiş olduğumuz bir süreç var makine çevirisinde. Devam edebiliriz hocam. Kısaca şeye değinmek istiyorum ben. Bizim yaptığımız çalışmaya benzer literatürde ne tarz çalışmalar var? Aslında biz öğrencilerin görüşlerini almak istedik. 
bu bağlamda üç tane çalışma e, karşımıza çıktı. E, Şafavne ve Elemra'nın bir çalışması var. 167 tane e, tercümana, 200 tane lisansüstüne, tercüme tercümanlık öğrencisine, 50 öğretim elemanına ve 50 üniversite tercümanlarına anket uyguluyor. Ve yapay zeka ve çevirme e, ile ilgili sorular soruyor. Bu bağlamda elde ettiği cevaplara göre bakıldığında ise 164 oranında bir katılımcı yapay zekanın mezun kalitesini artırdığını düşünüyor. Çok mu hatırlıyor hocam? Şu an sesim mi? Hocam ben sesim şu an. Evet. Şu an duyuyor musunuz hocalarım? Duyuyor aslında. Ee, şey mi? Zeynep hocam gelmiyor mu sesin? Geliyor aslında. Tamam, tamam o zaman devam ediyorum ben. Ee, e, 174 oranında yapay zeka e, çeviri öğrenimi öğretimini kolaylaştırdığını düşünüyorlar. %70 oranında katılımcı da yapay zeka doğru çeviri e, sunduğunu düşünüyor. İkinci çalışmada ise Hidaya, Aditya ve Vihadi'nin bir çalışması var. O da çeviri öğrencilerine yapay zeka ile ilgili sorular soruyor. Ve yüzde 89 buçu asla yapay zekanın farkında e, ve bu yapay zeka entegre araçları yüzde 52 oranında kullanan var. Ve yüzde 73 oranındaki e, katılımcı da çeviri araçlarında yüzde 80 doğruluk olduğunu düşünüyor. Son olarak Kirov ve Malami'nin çalışması var. Dijital teknoloji ile çevirmenlerin görüşleri üzerine bir çalışma yapıyor. 188 çevirmene anket uyguluyor. Ve e, genel olarak e, dijital teknolojinin çeviriye katkısını olumlu görenler, 40 yaş üstünde %86-41-50 yaş arası 62-51-60 yaş arası %50 oranında e, görülüyor. E, ve %64'ü yapay zekayı aslında eğitim bir avantaj olarak görüyor. %61 oranındaki katılımcı da çevirmenlik mesleğinin yapay zeka nedeniyle değişeceğini, görevlerin, rollerin değişeceğini, bazılarının yok olacağını ve yeni görevler geleceği mesela bu bağlamda artık çevirmen çeviri yapmayacak ama makine çevirisinden çıkan e, çeviriyi post editing yapacak gibi bir e, bakış açısı var. E, ve %17 oranında katılımcı yapay zekanın mesleği ellerinden alacağından korkuyor. %52 oranındaki ise da, bu konuda daha az endişeli aslında. E, ancak Oranlara baktığımızda %17 5 yıl içinde, %21 10 yıl içinde, %15 de 20 yıl içinde bu mesleğin yok olacağını düşünüyorlar. Türk literatürüne baktığımızda geçebiliriz hocam. Yapay zeka ile ilgili, daha doğrusu yapay zeka ve çevirmen görüşünü ilişkilendiren sadece bir çalışma var. O da bir bildiri ve hani bildiriyi dinleyemediğimiz için ve henüz yayınlanmadığı için çalışmanın genel kısmı ile ilgili bir bilgimiz yok. Ama Adli ortamlarda çevirmen bilir kişilerin çeviri teknolojileri ve yapay zeka kullanımları üzerine bir çalışma yapılmış ve benzer şekilde adli ortamlarda çalışanlara yani mahkeme çevirmenlerine yapay zeka kullanımına ilişkin sorular sorulmuş. Sonucu muhtemelen yayınlandığında göreceğiz. Onun dışındaki çalışmalarda daha çok aslında makine çevirisinin, yapay zeka entegre makine çevirisinin kalitesine odaklı çalışmalar yapılmış. E, görüş odaklı Türkiye'de başka bir çalışma yok. Bu şeyde de bacaksız ve yaman e, yapay zeka entegre makine çevirilerine çeviri performanslarını değerlendiriyorlar. Türkçeden İngilizceye çeviriler, İngilizceden Türkçeye çeviriler yapıyorlar farklı metin türlerinde. Ve bacaksız baktığında anlam aktarmada başarılı ama biçimi aktarmada çok da yeterli durumda değil hala diyor. E, Yaman'ın e, çalışmasına bakıldığında ise Yaman da aslında bilgilendirici metinlerde çok iyi sonuçlar verebiliyor ama anlatımcı ve işlevsel metinlerde hala makine çevirisinin, yapay zeka entegre makine çevirisinin doğruluk oranında düşüklük olduğunu e, dile getiriyor. E, benim anlatacağım 
olsun. Bu kadar. E, devamını Zeynep Hoca'ya bırakıyorum. Teşekkür ediyorum. Çok teşekkür ederim Mehtap Hocam. Ben de e, veri toplama sürecimiz ve bulgularımız hakkında bilgi vereceğim. Mehtap Hocamızın bahsettiği gibi Kırıkkale Üniversitesi İngilizce Mütercim Tercümanlık bölümündeki öğrencilerimize 16 sorudan oluşan bir anket uyguladık. E, anketin soru dağılımına bakacak olursak 5 sorumuz demografik bilgi toplamaya yönelikte. 6 sorumuz yapay zeka destekli araçların kullanımı ile ilgili öğrencilerimize yönelttiğimiz sorulardı. 3 sorumuz çevirmenlik mesleğinin geleceği yapay zekanın etkisiyle ilgili ve son iki sorumuz da bölüm müfredatları ve aldıkları eğitimin e, yapay zeka ve gelecekteki kullanımları açısından yeterli olup olmadığına yönelik sorulardı. Katılımcılarımız ile ilgili genel bilgilerimiz ise şu şekilde biz e, müfredatın ve eğitim sürecinin aslında etkisini görmek istediğimiz için birinci sınıf ve dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerine odaklandık. Dördüncü sınıftan bu kapsamda 36 öğrencimiz çalışmada ya katıldı. Bunlardan 15'i erkek, 21'i kadın ve yaş ortalaması 22 bir gördük. Birinci sınıf öğrencilerimizden ise 38 kişi bu çalışmada yer aldı. 12'si erkek, 26'sı kadın ve yaş ortalamaları ise 20 bir 92 olarak tespit edildi. Demografik bilgi kısmında öğrencilerimizin profesyonel çeviri deneyimleri ya da staj deneyimleri oldu mu bunu da öğrenmek istedik. Daha önce staj yapan dördüncü sınıflarda 5 öğrencimiz varken birinci sınıfların tabii ki henüz staj deneyimi yok. Profesyonel çeviri deneyimi staj dışında yapan, sahip olan var mı diye öğrenmek istedik. Dördüncü sınıflarda bir yıldan az olarak profesyonel çeviri deneyimi olduğunu belirten dört öğrencimiz, bir ila üç yıl arasında profesyonel çeviri deneyimi olduğunu belirten üç öğrencimiz varken birinci sınıflarda yalnızca bir yıldan az e, profesyonel çeviri deneyimi olduğunu söyleyen bir öğrencimiz vardı. Genel olarak bulgularımıza bakacak olursak sorularımızı kapıca inceleyelim. Ee, öncelikle e, ilk olarak e, öğrencilerimize yapay zeka uygulamalarının çeviri amaçlı kullanımı hakkında yeterli bilgiye sahip olup olmadıklarını e, düşünüyorlar mı? Bunu sorduk. E, genel kıyaslamaya baktığımızda dördüncü sınıf öğrencileri ağırlıklı olarak yeterli bilgiye sahip olduğunu söylerken birinci sınıf öğrencileri henüz e, yeterli bilgiye sahip olmadığını belirttiğini görüyoruz. Bir diğer sorumuz yapay zeka temelli çeviri araçlarından ya da çeviri amaçlı kullanılan yapay zeka uygulamalarından hangilerini duydukları ile ilgiliydi? Alanda sıklıkla kullanılan ve popüler olan uygulamalardan biz bazılarını örnek olarak verdik. ChatGPT, Krillbot, DeepL, Google Translate, Microsoft Translator, SmartGet, Memsource, Prados, Corpus Tools gibi. Bunların dışında öğrenciler hepsini ya da hiçbirini seçeneklerinde işaretleyebilirken farklı duydukları veya kullandıkları araçlar varsa diğer kısmında bunu da belirtebileceklerini söyledik. Genel olarak baktığımızda ise dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizin birinci sınıf öğrencilerinden farklı olarak çeviri amaçlı kullanılan SmartCat ve Memsource, Trados gibi uygulamaları duyduklarını ancak birinci sınıf öğrencilerinin Farklı alanlarda da çalışma yapan e, insanların kullandığı e, ChatGPT ve Google Tra Translate uygulamalarını ağırlıklı olarak duyduklarını söyleyebiliriz. Peki bu duydukları ve bildikleri e, uygulamaların uygulamalardan hangilerini aktif olarak kullanıyorlar? Öğrencileri bunu da sorduğumuzda benzer bir şekilde dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerinin birinci sınıf öğrencilerinden ayrılarak SmartCat ve Memsource gibi müfredat kapsamında eğitimini aldıkları araçları ağırlıklı olarak kullandıklarını ve DeepL gibi e, yeni popülerlik kazanan çeviri uygulamasını da daha sıklıkla kullandıklarını görüyoruz. Birinci sınıf öğrencilerinin kullandığı uygulama ve araçlarsa ağırlıklı olarak ChatGPT ve Google Translate ile sınırlı kalmaktadır. Dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerinin bilme ve kullanma kıyaslaması yaptığımızda ise en yaygın olarak bilinen ve buna bağlı olarak kullanılan uygulamaların Google Translate ve Memsource olduğu göze çarpmaktadır. Buna yakın zamanlarda yine daha popülerlik kazanan ChatGPT ve DeepL'i de dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizin yaygın bir şekilde kullandığını söyleyebiliriz. Birinci sınıf öğrencilerimizin e, yapay zeka uygulama ve araçlarını bilme ve kullanma durumunu kıyasladığımızda ise e, tutarlı bir şekilde ChatGPT ve Google Translate'i paralel olarak e, kullandıklarını söyleyebiliriz. 
Öğrencilerimiz de yapay zeka uygulamalarını çevirilerde ne kadar sıklıkla kullandıklarını da sorduk. E, buna göre dördüncü e, sınıf öğrencilerinin ağırlıklı olarak ara sıra ve sıklıkla cevabı verdiğini görebiliyoruz. Birinci sınıf öğrencilerimiz ise henüz e, çeviri dersleri olmadığı için ve ağırlıklı olarak çeviri yapmadıkları için aslında kısmen cevabını verdiklerini görebiliyoruz. Yapay zeka temelli araçları e, ne amaçlarla, hangi amaçlarla kullandıklarını da sorduk öğrencilerimize. E, açıklama olarak verdiğimiz bazı örnekler cümleleri çevirmek için, terim çıkarmak için, araştırma yapmak için, kelimelerin anlamına bakmak için, e, proofreading yani son düzeltme yapmak için, paraphrasing yani yeniden yazmak için ve diğer seçeneğinde ise aklını, e, akıllarına gelen ya da farklı amaçlarla kullandıklarını e, Amaçları belirtmeleri için de bir sekme e, açmıştık. Bu kısımda üç öğrencimiz sadece kontrol etmek ya da machine translation post editing dediğimiz e, makine çevirisi sonrası düzeltme amacıyla kullandıklarını belirtmişlerdi. Dördüncü sınıf ve birinci sınıf öğrencilerini kıyasladığımızda ise e, aslında benzer olarak kelime anlamına bakmak için ağırlıklı olarak her iki grubun da kullandığını görüyoruz. Ancak birinci sınıf öğrencilerimiz henüz çeviri amaçlı cümle ya da metin çevirisine geçmedikleri için dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizin daha çeşitli amaçlar için cümleleri çevirmek, terim çıkartmak, son düzeltme yapmak ya da yeniden yazmak için de ağırlıklı olarak bu araçlardan faydalandığını söyleyebiliriz. Kabaca bir yüzde kıyaslaması yaptığımızda her iki grubun da aslında kelime anlamına bakmak için ağırlıklı olarak bu araçlara başvurduklarını söyleyebiliriz. Ama dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerinin terim çıkarmak ya da kelime bazlı değerlendirme dışında cümleleri çevirmek, son düzeltme yapmak ya da kontrol yapmak amaçlı da bu araçları ağırlıklı olarak kullandıklarını söyleyebiliriz. Yapay zeka uygulamalarının makine çevirisinde doğruluk oranına ilişkin inançlarını da öğrenmek istedik. Öğrencilerimizin burada ilginç e, olacak şekilde e, öğrencilerimizin yani dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizin e, genellikle daha şüpheli yaklaştığı, daha doğru olduğunu, makine çevirisine daha fazla güvendiklerini, genellikle doğru olduğunu belirtirken birinci sınıf öğrencilerinin kararsızlıklarının daha fazla olduğunu ya da doğru değil, hiç doğru değil gibi karşılıklarda bulunduklarını yani makine çevirisinde verdiği çevirilere birinci sınıf öğrencilerinin aslında daha az güvendiklerini görebiliyoruz. Öğrencilerimizin mesleki e, kaygılarını anlamak için öncelikle profesyonel olarak yazılı çevirmenlik yapmak isteyip istemediklerini de sorduk. E, buna göre her ne kadar dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizden de nispeten kararsız olan e, öğrenci sayısı fazla olsa da genel olarak bu mesleği yapmak istediklerini her iki grup için de söyleyebiliriz. Bir diğer sorumuz yapay zekayı çevirmen olarak mesleğinizde ne derece kullanacağınızı düşünüyorsunuz? Ee, gelecekte ne kadar aktif olarak yapay zeka uygulamalarının ve araçlarının e, mesleklerine, mesleklerinde yer alacağını sorduk. Ee, buna göre dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimiz zaten eğitim süreçlerinde de bu araçlardan faydalandıkları için kullanacakları ya da kesinlik, kesinlikle kullanacakları yönünde e, beyanda bulunurken birinci sınıf öğrencilerimiz e, farklı bir şekilde kararsız olduklarını hatta kullanmayacaklarını bile belirttiklerini görebiliyoruz. Yapay zekanın yakın gelecekte mesleklerini olumsuz etkileyip etkilemeyeceklerini e, ile ilgili düşüncelerini öğrencilerimize sorduğumuzda ise aslında daha önce verdikleri cevaplarla tutarlı olarak dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizin e, olumsuz etkileyebileceğine yönelik ya da kararsız olduklarına yönelik e, cevaplarla karşılaşırken birinci sınıf öğrencileri zaten yapay zekanın verdiği makine çevirisinin doğruluk oranına çok fazla güvenmiyorlardı. Ya da çok fazla kullanacaklarını düşünmüyorlardı. Buna paralel olarak da gelecekte mesleklerini olumsuz etkileyeceklerine henüz inanmadıklarını görüyoruz. Müfredat ve ders içeriklerindeki ve içeriklerinde verilen e, çeviri amaçlı yapay zeka uygulamaları eğitiminin yeterli olup olmadığına yönelik sor, e, sorumuza ise dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimiz e, yeterli değil ya da yeterli bilmiyorum gibi cevaplar verirken birinci sınıf öğrencilerimiz henüz e, bu dersleri almaya başlamadıkları için e, bilmiyorum şeklinde çoğunlukla cevap vermiştir. Öğrencilerin e, cümlelerini de yeterli olup olup 
yeterli olduğunu söyleyen dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizden bir örnek vermek istiyorum. Mesela yapay zekanın çeviride kullanımına odaklı iki ders aldık. Bu derslerin yapay zekayı çevirli amaçlı kullanmada işe yarar olduğunu düşünüyorum. Bu derslerin alana kadar, bu dersleri alana kadar yapay zekanın çeviride kullanılabileceğini bilmiyordum dediğini görüyoruz. Bir diğer öğrencimiz BDC ve çevir teknoloji derslerinde çeviri programlarının nasıl kullanılacağı detaylı olarak öğretildiği ve çeşitli derslerde yapay zeka kullanımına izin verildiği için yeterli olduğunu düşünüyorum. Bir öğrencimiz ise öğrenim süremiz içerisinde bu konuyla alakalı en az 3 dersimiz oluyor ve bunun dışında diğer derslerde de bu konuya eğiliyor, değiniliyor diye belirtmektedir. Bilmediğini söyleyen öğrencilerimiz ise genellikle birinci sınıf öğrencisi olmakla beraber dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizden de aslında geleceğe yönelik mesleklerinde e, ne kadar aktif kullanacakları ile ilgili ya da e, ne kadar yer kaplayacağı ile ilgili endişeleri olduğu için belki de e, emin olamadıkları için bazı ifadeler e, bildirmişlerdir. Mesela birinci sınıf öğrencilere yapay zeka ile ilgili bilgilenebileceğimiz, nasıl daha yararlı kullanıla, kullanabileceğimizi anlatan ders içeriği olabilir. E, ama henüz e, almadılar bu dersleri. Dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizden ise e, gibi BDT Geçici araçlarını öğrendik, Antikonk gibi korpus tool öğrendik. Yeterli sayılabilir ancak daha çok fazla yapay zeka uygulamaları var ama bunları öğrenmiyoruz şeklinde bir beyanları olmuş. Yeterli değil diyen öğrencilerimiz ise birinci sınıf öğrencimiz mesela müfredat ve ders içeriklerini yeterli buluyorum. Çünkü bizde mesleğimizi hazırlamada yeterli ama yapay zeka uygulamaları bakımından şu ana kadar herhangi bir şey göremedim. Dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizden ise yapay zeka destekli çeviri teknolojileri ve BDC dersleri tek dönemle sınırlı kaldığı için tamamen yeterli olduğunu düşünmüyorum. Yazın çevirisi haricinde yapay zeka destekli çevirinin mesleğimiz açısından daha önemli hale geleceğini düşünüyorum. Gelecekte sözlü çevirilerde de aslında yapay zeka kullanılabilir. Farklı e, alanlarda da kullanılabilir. Belki bununla ilgili uygulamalara da yer e, vermemiz gerekecektir. Genel olarak sonuç kısmına geldiğimizde ilk olarak dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimizin öğrencilerine kıyasla yapay zeka uygulamalarının çeviride kullanımı ile ilgili daha fazla bilgiye sahip olduklarını ve daha çeşitli amaçları için bu uygulamalardan faydalandıklarını söyleyebiliriz. Dördüncü sınıf öğrencilerimiz birinci sınıf öğrencilerine kıyasla yapay zeka uygulamalarına Çeviri yaparken daha fazla güvenmektedir. Ee, ancak bu güven aynı zamanda da yapay zekanın gelecekte mesleklerini etkileyeceği algısını da arttırmaktadır. Birinci sınıf öğrencileri müfredat noktasında henüz bilgi sahibi olmadıklarını belirtirken dördüncü sınıf öğrencileri yapay zeka ile ilgili derslerinin yeterli olmadığını ya da emin olamadıklarını düşünmektedirler. Bu da e, öğrencilerin yapay zekanın gelecekte mesleklerine etkisiyle ilgili endişeleri ve belirsizliklerle ilgili olabileceği düşünülmektedir. Öğrencilerin genel olarak staj ve profesyonel çeviri deneyimlerine de baktığımızda çok az sayıda dördüncü sınıf öğrencisinin bu tecrübeye sahip olduğu görülmektedir. Bu deneyimlerin arttırılması belki de yapay zeka uygulamalarının profesyonel hayatlar, hayatlarında kullanımını görmeleri ve bazı belirsizliklerin ortadan kaldırılması noktasında öğrencilerimize de faydalı olabilir diye önerebiliriz. Referanslarımız bu şekilde. Uh, thank you so much for all the presenters. Uh, çok teşekkür ederim uh, tüm değerli katkılarınız için. Ve süreyi epeyce de açtık. Biraz benim konuşmamdan da kaynaklandı. Uh, çok kısa belki bilmiyorum bir soru alabilir miyiz ama sanırım diğer oturumlar evet uh, başlıyor. Um, ben tüm katılımcı e, hocalarımıza çok çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Ee, şimdi sözü sanırım e, diğer moderatör hocamıza bırakıyorum. Evet, e, doçent doktor Ökkeş Narin hocamız sanırım e, burada. Evet, e, çok teşekkür ediyorum tekrar değerli katkılarınız için. Ee, hocam oturumumuz devam ediyor değil mi? Ee, ben de tam Evet e, şu anda sanırım e, Ökkeş hocamız e, sunumunu hazırlıyor herhalde. Nasıl bir yol izleyelim hocam?
Ee, hocam ben bu aralık çocuk sorusu Tabii. olarak kullanabilir Tabii miyim? ki. Aslında Lütfen buyurun. sorum Kazviye hocama. Ee, sizin konuştuklarınızı dinlerken çok eğlendim. I think çünkü bence de kendimin hep görselliğine bir şeyler oldu. These rhetoric, because it is a rhetoric, shows us how gender discrimination can determine and dehumanize women. Would you agree with that? Do you think? Because when we talk about barking and things along the lines, I think it almost treats us as animals of sorts. I certainly agree with that because there were so intensely negative words, phrases, insults. You know, it was even difficult to translate them. So uh, I certainly agree with that. Thank you, Oda. So much for your comment. Of course. Actually, uh, yeah, we have uh, listened to really uh, inspirational talks and very informative. Uh, so all these talks are really very insightful. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that's aligned with the theme of our uh, Congress, okay? The innovation. Thank you so much. And uh, Zeynep. And Mehtap Hocam's uh, talk uh, was also very insightful. Yeah, and uh, we had, um, well, I've been always thinking about the what, how uh, students at the translation and interpretation departments actually think of uh, possible uses of uh, the uh, artificial intelligence. And thank you so much, yeah, for uh informing us of their views thank you so much hocam for your kind comments actually we were also very surprised with our results because we were expecting the first year students were too scared about the future of their profession but actually we found the otherwise around um so it proves that the education has an important effect on their on the development of their professional skill but still we need to work on that so in that sense we are also happy with our results thank you and uh, Kadri Ojam's uh, talk was also very informative and insightful yeah so uh, thank you so much uh, for yeah informing us I think of a really uh, very hot topic actually uh and uh sharing with us these excerpts actually they're very revealing thank you uh hojalarim do you think i think we can just close the session i think yeah that's what i need to do thank you so much once again yeah i'm just leaving yeah the room closing the session thank you bye bye can we have a photo together, maybe? No, can. Can one person just maybe take it? Mehta Pojam or Zeynep Pojam, could you just maybe have a photo? Yes, thank you. 